This is an interview of Casey Luskin of the Discovery Institute on Fox News. In it, Casey butchers science, reality, and just flat out lies through his teeth to support his primitive views. Now, please note that this is the same clown who felt himself qualified enough to critique a peer-reviewed publication about the evolution of the tetrapod arm without even knowing the names of the major bones of the arm. Welcome back. When a Texas Board of Education approved objections to evolution in textbooks, the fight over how to teach the subject, evolution, should have been over. But some textbooks are still getting it wrong, raising the question, should the board be stripped of its power to choose textbooks? Join us right now from the Discovery Institute, an organization that has been heavily involved in the Texas case, is Casey Luskin. Uh, good morning to you, Casey. Thanks for having me. Okay. Now, I, your problem, and the whole thing, creationism versus Darwinism, is, is uh, you know, white hot these days. You are, you, your main problem with science books is that they take a one-sided look at evolution, right? That's exactly right. Unfortunately, the vast majority of biology textbooks today really center from students any of the science that challenges Darwin. No, Luskin, the science doesn't challenge Darwin. You simply don't understand science and don't understand how factually inept your arguments are. For example, let's take a flat earther who stands up and says, yeah, well, if the earth is really round, then why don't all the Asian people fall off of the bottom? That's exactly what Luskin is doing. He's not understanding the arguments and therefore views the concept around earth evolution as being false because he thinks that he has this big hole. But again, his knowledge is so limited that he doesn't understand that those quote-unquote holes don't really exist. This is not about teaching creationism. This is simply about allowing students to hear about some of the evidence that's, that challenges evolution as well as the evidence that supports it. Right, exactly. Now, uh, and you told me during the break about 100% of the mainstream books get it wrong regarding evolution. And for instance, Haeckel's embryos, how do they get that wrong, all the books? Well, there are biology textbooks in use today that use these drawings of vertebrate embryos, things like chickens and cows and, and humans. And biologists have known that these drawings were fraudulent for over 100 years. But what these mm -hmm. drawings do is they obscure the differences between the, the early stages of embryos in order to make it look like all these different vertebrate uh, groups share a common ancestor. But we've known for hundreds of years, for decades, that these, these drawings are fraudulent, and they are still in many textbooks that are used today. And we think that students should be getting you know, the most accurate and objective evidence for evolution, not these fraudulent right. drawings. And Okay, it's time that we address the creationist favorite Heckel's embryos. Okay, um, it's a well-known fact that organisms, while they're developing, converge during their phylotypic stages to appear very similarly. Um, that's really not disputed. Dolphins and snakes both have leg buds, chickens look like humans, it's a fact, it happens. Now, what Heckel falsely believed was that um, a vertebrate organism passed through different stages um, reflecting its evolution. So, for example, he argued that a human being would pass through a stage where it looked like a fish, then an amphibian, then a reptile, then onto the mammals that we are. Um, he based this belief largely on an assumption that DNA couldn't really change, which, by the way, is a, is a creationist favorite, um, that DNA had certain constraints, and that the embryo was sort of locked into its developmental course where, and that modifications happened in the adult human being, or in the adult animal. Um, we now know this to be false. So what Heckel did was to exaggerate these similarities to demonstrate his point. So think of a caricature, where the, the prominent features of a person are made much more prominent. Now, note that Heckel didn't make any of these characteristics or similarities up. They are really all there in the embryos, and they are very similar. Um, that being said, however, exaggerating them still isn't acceptable in science, which is why Heckel's embryos are viewed the way they are. Note that the ironic thing about this is that Luskin is doing the same exact thing Heckel did. Um, while Heckel dishonestly exaggerated the similarities in the embryos, Luskin is dishonestly exaggerating the differences in the embryos. He's doing the exact same thing, although I would argue that what Luskin is doing is more immoral, simply because... What Heckel based his drawings on actually existed. These similarities are there. Whereas what Luskin is doing is he's trying to mislead you into thinking that there are no similarities whatsoever, which is more dishonest because he's fabricating something. Also, for some strange reason, creationists seem to think that Heckel's embryos are a major source of people accepting evolution, when that's simply not the case. Um, the, the similarities during development are nowhere near the strongest pieces of evidence supporting evolution, but instead they simply focus on this one thing because that's all that they can grasp at. You know, it, it's actually kind of similar to um, 
the people denying dinosaurs existed and finding one paleontologist who fabricated a dinosaur fossil so that he could get famous. And then they take that fossil and say, aha, this fossil is, is forged. All the books containing dinosaur fossils uh, have it all wrong. It's completely wrong. Dinosaurs never existed. We win. That's exactly what Luskin is doing, and that's exactly what creationists always do. Another example is Darwin's Tree of Life. I mean, that's what I learned back in the day, but there are holes all punched through that as well. As we learn more and more about the DNA evidence, we're finding that when you take one gene, it gives you one version of the Tree of Life, but when you use a different gene, it gives you an entirely different version of the Tree of Life. I'd like to quickly point out that the last bit was a blatant lie. This is something that's been remarkably well studied, and, and every major dream, gene in every organism not subject to horizontal gene transfer adheres to and su completely supports the Tree of Life. Now, everything from the molecules in your eye helping you see to even snake venom completely adheres to the tree of life and supports it. I'll touch more on this here in one second. I'll let Les can finish. An article in the journal New Scientist recently said that the tree of life is being, quote, annihilated, unquote, by the new DNA evidence. And yet when we look at textbooks, they present the tree of life as if it's an unadulterated right. fact. Folks, this is a perfect example as to why exactly you cannot trust these people. What the article in New Scientist demonstrated was that there was much more horizontal gene transfer early on than what we thought. So what is horizontal gene transfer? Well, it, it basically happens when two organisms of different species swap genes with each other. Uh, this happens mostly in bacteria and lower level organisms. It's actually one of the major problems with antibiotic resistance in the sense that we all have normal flora and bacteria in our intestinal tracts. Well, what happens when we take antibiotics is that we select for um, our normal flora that are resistant to those antibiotics because they have the resistant genes. Now what happens later on when we get a pathogenic infection is that the genes, that those resistance genes from our normal flora can actually be passed to the pathogenic bacteria causing them to become resistant to antibiotics too. So what Casey Luskin is, is basically doing here is taking the example of, of new scientists, which was that there was there's much more horizontal gene transfer in the lower tree of life than what we previously thought, and he's applying it to the entire tree, as if there's this murkying of the water between amphibians and reptiles and birds and, and mammals and things like that, which simply isn't the case. If anything, the article in New Scientist applied to the bottom one-fifteenth of the tree, where the remainder of the tree is perfectly intact. There is no horizontal gene transfer between larger organisms, simply because that doesn't happen. Now, as far as why shouldn't that be included in the textbook, do you really think that it's appropriate to be telling a, th a third grader, well, it's not really the tree of life, it's actually the web of life because there's much more horizontal gene transfer in far primitive organisms? No. Sorry, that's simply not appropriate. The tree of life is an appropriate description for the vast majority of the tree and for what's trying to be portrayed here. Luskin simply doesn't count on you being able to know that. So what it comes down to for you is 100%, uh, near 100% of the textbooks get it wrong. You're not taking a side whether it, evolution is right or creationism right. You're just simply saying if the textbooks are going to be teaching evolution, get it right because everybody's getting it wrong. Well, we don't support the teaching of creationism, but we do support the teaching of good science. And the best science shows that there is a real scientific yep. controversy over this. All right, uh, Casey Luskin joining us from the Discovery Institute in Seattle. Casey, thank you very much. Thank you. There may be some sort of controversy in the land of dishonest troglodytes, but in the scientific community, there is no controversy, and there hasn't been for at least 100 years. Now, what gets me here the most is probably the hypocrisy. So, I mean, here we have a guy who's, who's willing to go on the picture tube and tell lie after lie after lie and butcher science at the same time claiming to have the moral position and preserve science. I mean, even Holocaust deniers don't stoop to this level of hypocrisy. Casey Luskin of the Discovery Institute, ladies and gentlemen, give him a hand. And here it is, your moment of zen.